Hi everyone, Bob is on vacation. I'm Matt Lauer and I thank you for staying up later. Tonight we will talk to actress Mimi Rogers. She's pretty, she's smart, she's talented, she's controversial and some would say she's a contradiction in terms. For example, she's working on a couple of family movies hot on the heels of a provocative Playboy layout. We'll let her explain all that. Tonight on Later, it's Mimi Rogers. with a movie that people tend to recognize right off the bat and this is someone to watch over me mm -hmm. huge break or just another job for you at the time no it was an enormous break it was uh, it was my first starring role in a big studio film uh, which was a you know a dramatic departure from from the jobs I'd had previously and it was also um, you know the kind of role that it was it was you know a very very much of a throwback to kind of a 40s leading lady where it was a grace kelly type yeah of my role. job was to be rich and glamorous and impeccable and all you know Let, for the people who didn't see it we should say that you played a woman very wealthy woman who witnesses a murder right and therein is the suspense thriller part of this movie. right but the convincing job you did on this rich bitch is the wrong word no she was just she was she she wasn't a bitch in any way, but what she had was the aura of when you are raised, you know, in an eggshell, when you're raised in a very rarefied atmosphere. You know, she came from an incredibly wealthy family and was raised in a way that's definitely foreign, you know, to most of the people who live in this country. When you take on this role, are you thinking, man, I want to sink my teeth into this one? Or, this is a stretch for me. I'm, you're not like that. No. Mm -hmm. so, so how did you go about preparing for this? Well, a couple of ways. I think, I think I have, you know, a certain understanding of dignity, if you will. But there are actually a, a couple of women that I know in New York who, one in particular, who is the type of woman that literally any time you see her, she is impeccable. And I don't mean overly made up or, you know, big hair or anything. She's just impeccable. Perfectly dressed, the perfect jewelry however understated it may be she would it just i never saw her ever when she wasn't perfect kind of unpracticed elegance yeah but but perfect and i thought that's claire that's that's the thing that i want to strive for and so claire didn't have to be dressed to the nines but whatever she wore she was just perfect excuse me this is my dressing room and those are my clothes now, I understand your responsibilities, but I would appreciate it if you would stay out of here at all times. Sorry, Miss Gregory. I was uh, just uh, checking around. Excuse me. Excuse me. Other way. It's hard to find the doors in this place. Lieutenant. Detective. I, um, I hope you understand how upsetting this is. The movie had a lot of great elements. It had this terrific character. It had a love interest with a person from a completely different class, right. played by Tom Berenger. But it also had the thriller aspects from a wait until dark type movie. Sure, being did, pursued. Did the movie make the splash with all those elements? Did the movie make the splash you were hoping it would make? No, unfortunately it didn't. And. I really do believe that the film was a victim of studio politics. Meaning what? Well, meaning that the person who was running Columbia at the time when the movie was greenlit, uh, there was a change of regime really right before the, uh, Someone to Watch Over Me came out. And normally, the, a new regime coming in is very um, somewhat hostile to the to pictures the that projects. were that were created under the old regime and this i think was a particularly acrimonious changeover so really the, the film was dumped there was not a lot of care or attention given but let to me it. stop you here because people are listening right now they're thinking hollywood sour mean? grapes no no yeah i, so, I mean I but can this is a common that. fact 
this is a common fact. This is the sort of thing that does happen, and it's unfortunate because with a film like that, when you don't have big giant stars in, in the title roles, there is an art to releasing a film. And I think the American public has gotten more sophisticated about it because there's so much written now about films and their grosses and how they're released. But there is an art to releasing a film. And particularly with a film like that, you, you have to take care. You have to start your ad campaign early. You have to release it at the right time. You have to factor in what other movies are out. And unfortunately, with our movie, there really wasn't an ad campaign. The, the ads sort of started running a couple of weeks before it came out, and then it was just out. But critically, it did very well. Critically, it did very well. And you well. did even better. Critically, it did very well. And the film has had an amazing shelf life just in the sense that how it's done on video and how it's done on cable, um, they seem to run it all the time. And more than anything, more than anything I've done, uh, I have so many people who will come up and say, I have to tell you, that's one of my favorite movies. I actually had to go out and buy it because I like to watch it a lot. I think one of the great things about the film, and, and you said that you based the character on someone you knew, but when we watched it, we all knew someone like that. Mm. And it was very easy to identify with. Yeah. What did it do for you in Hollywood? The movie's out, you're critically very successful in the film. The, the common thought would be the phone starts to ring off the hook. Well, what it did for me is a little, it's a little bit different. If the film had been, you know, a giant financial success, then, you know, you have that medi meteoric change. But what it did for me is that I essentially went from being an unknown commodity to a known commodity. Uh, the kind of directors, the kind of producers that I'd be interested in working with at least had an awareness of who I was, that I existed as. But did they think you were you or were you Claire? Well, unfortunately they, they thought really of me as Claire. I mean, that, that as wonderful as the role was for me, it, it was interesting that even within the industry where you think there'd be an understanding that a person is acting, um, I, a lot I encountered after that um, you know, I'd want to go in on a certain film and we'd hear, well, she's too patrician, she's too elegant, she's too... I'm like, guys, I was acting. You know, let me just go in there and meet and they can see who I really am. There, there's a, a note in your voice or a tone in your voice that, that that still bugs you a little bit, that they had that feeling. It doesn't bug me, it just surprised me because, as I said, you would think people in, within the business to have an understanding that actors act. So if they see you playing a role, there would be... A, you would think there would be an automatic assumption or an understanding of she's playing a role. Right. This isn't necessarily who she is. And I want to talk a little bit about your childhood. You grew up in Coral Gables, or well, at least part of the time. I was born there. I, I was there for about a year. You moved around a lot. For what reason? Your dad's job? Well, it was a combination of, of his job. He was a civil engineer, and I think essentially he just liked to move. He didn't like to stay in one place for very long. It's tough on a, on a child. Yeah. What was the longest you lived in one place? About a year. That's, that's extraordinary. It, it creates a sense in a child that, boy, you have to know how, and I noticed this the first time I met you, that you meet you and you don't waste any time drawing a connection. Is that a skill that's, that's based on the fact that you moved around so often? Hmm. I don't know. I, I haven't thought about that. I, you're probably right because, you know, the situation you're in is that you're always the new kid. Right. You're always in a new school. You're always making new friends. And... You, it's kind of adapt or die, you know. You have to... Uh, the one thing... Do you remember uh, Woody Allen's film, Zelig? Mm -hmm. I mean, that really got to me, that movie. I really responded very emotionally to that film because I realized that more than anything, I felt like a chameleon in the sense that with each new place, you, have, you slightly alter yourself, you slightly change to fit into your new surroundings. And maybe lose sense of... And maybe to a certain degree wonder who, who you really, really are underneath that. Because you're always changing, you're always adapting. But think about that. I mean, you've almost just described an actress. Of course. It was perfect basic training. Back now with Mimi Rogers. Take us to 1991 now. A movie comes along, title of which is The Rapture, which I watched last night. Um, unusual role, especially going from the last one that we knew a lot about, Someone to Watch Over Me, to The Rapture. Give a thumbnail sketch to the people who didn't see it, what this one was about. A thumbnail sketch. Um, 
Well, actually, David Anson sort of capsulized it the best. He called it a theological film noir. And so in a thumbnail sketch, it's about a woman who is, is leading a very bleak, a very empty existence who is essentially so empty and so unhappy that she wants to kill herself. She finds God and goes on a very um, kind of interesting religious journey, has several tragedies, and ends up in a position of questioning God and questioning faith and... One of the things you've left out, conveniently... Kills your daughter. ...is that in the part of the movie where she is leading this bleak existence... She's a sexual swinger. She is a real sexual swinger. Yeah. Almost to the psychopathic side. Right, group sex. Completely, completely emotionless. Completely uninvolved. It's a purely physical... It, it's it's to me that it was an indication of a, of um, an emptiness so great that you keep pushing further and further in the attempt just to feel something. But I guess I'm wondering when you, when you see the script on this one before you shoot it and you get to that part and you go, "Hello, uh, did you think twice about that?" Well, yeah, I thought I thought several times about it, but I was really powerfully affected when I read the script. Um, you know, to me, it was a very, a very sad and a very emotionally powerful story, the odyssey that this woman goes on, and, and the type of spiritual malaise, the soul sickness that she's suffering, to me, related a lot to, to what we see around the world, and in this country in particular, of a society that's so disintegrated and so spread apart that there are a lot of people who just fall between the cracks and they're lost and they're isolated and that sense of isolation that sense of floating without any connection and the the kind of howling loneliness and emptiness that that brings i i understood what was motivating the behavior and i felt that as uncomfortable as the scenes might be to shoot, that they were absolutely essential to the telling of the story. They were a little shocking, I have to be honest with you. But Having seen it in 1993... They're shocking, but I think you'd also say they're not sexy. You might be asking for something you can't handle. I can handle it. What if things go out of control? <laughs> What's control got to do with it? Hmm. I think he wants to find out if you have any limits. Tell him I haven't found them yet. Sharon hasn't found her limits yet. Talk, talk, talk. Let's go somewhere. Come here. Come here and have a seat. Come on, I'll show you around. passion no this is a diversion but I'm thinking that if you're about to make this movie you have to know that if it doesn't come across if the Odyssey does not work where there's this finding of religion <laughs> and that it's gonna be seen and they're gonna come out in the papers they're gonna say Mimi did the movie and basically it was just sex for sex sake well that actually wasn't my concern because you know the the, the sexual aspect takes place really I think within the first 25 mm -hmm. minutes and then we're we're into all different territory what I what I was aware of is that it's either gonna work and it's gonna be a very interesting little movie or it's not gonna work and it's gonna be a real embarrassment but not so much because of the sexual s situations but just because the all of the material in it is so provocative that if it fails it's gonna fail rather badly it also demanded of the viewer that you use your imagination in a lot of it you had yes. to buy the premise yes you received great great reviews for that film yeah were you happy with the outcome not yourself only but the whole movie I'm very happy with the film I'm really proud of it two reasons why people and I think more inside the movie community than outside the movie community looked at it and said interesting choice Mimi Rogers for this role the one was the finding of the spiritual self in the film and people for years had heard about you and beliefs you held I don't want to call it religion because I'm uncomfortable with this but it's been well reported 
that Scientology has played a major role in your life. I'm going to plead ignorance here. I don't know much about Scientology, but did you draw correlations between what happens to this character in the movie in finding the spiritual self and what you had gone through in your life? Mm, really not at all. It's an interesting point because it's a question that's come up before and that I've been asked before and I'll say what, what I have said in the past which is a Scientology is, is a religious philosophy that I literally grew up around and in. You, and your with, dad's? Yeah, my parents became involved, you know, before I was born. So, as you can imagine, your, your attitude towards something is very different if you grow up in it as opposed to discovering it at some point in your life. So I never had a point in my life where I embraced or discovered Scientology. It was what I grew up around. And as you know, then that's just kind of a part of you. It's a philosophy and a system of ideas and beliefs that, that you simply grow up with. Um, so for me, the religious transformations or experiences in the rapture, you know, it wouldn't, it, whether I'd grown up Protestant or Catholic or Jewish or whatever, it, it really, you know, there wouldn't have been any particular correlation between the two. For me, um, it, it, it was much more about general concepts of connectedness versus disconnectedness, the, the need for some sort of religious or spiritual understanding or direction in, in the life, because I think part of what we see in the beginning is that when you have a person who is completely anchorless, mm -hmm. th it is desolate, and it, 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 it's not an existence that works. Pleading, the, pleading ignorance. Is Scientology something that, that is that governs a life to the extent where something like the nudity and the sex in this movie is a problem? No, not at all. So it doesn't have the same strict rules that say Catholicism might be connected but I think, to. Well, I don't know because I think there are actors and actresses who are Catholics who do nudity in film. I, I guess it would depend on, on the degree of devoutness someone had, if they felt that that was a sinful thing to do, then they wouldn't do it. But, you know, I, I don't have like an, an intensely organized connection with Scientology, you know, as a structure. It, you know, as I said, it's a, a system of religious philosophy mm -hmm. and beliefs that I grew up with that, that help form me, that will always be a part of me, that mean a lot to me, but I don't have a religious structure who is sitting in judgment or in, in any way dictating what I should or shouldn't do. When you hear people talk about it and if they attach a negative connotation to it, do you feel it's something you should defend or it's unnecessary? No, I feel, no, I feel it's unnecessary. I think, I think it's basically just noise. It's irrelevant. I think if people are interested in Scientology, they can always go and find out about it. And if they're not, I don't feel any pressing need to, to make them be interested. You know, I think, as I said, it, it's just something that is used to generate attention. When you did Playboy, was that utterly crucial to the development of Playboy? No. Or Mimi Rogers? Well, that had, that had nothing to do with filmmaking. You know, my reasons for doing it is I happen to think that nudity per se is fine. And I happen to think nudity in art is incredibly beautiful. And I think the human form is an aesthetically pleasing and beautiful thing. So. My purpose in doing pictures for Playboy was not to do something like kind of really like steamy sexual. I had a vision of doing something that I considered to be artistically really interesting. I have a lot of art in my home that um, whether it's black and white photography or oil paintings or pastels, I looked around one day and I realized I have a lot of nudes. Um, I, find, I find it really beautiful whether it's sculpture, whether it's, whether it's painting, whether it's photography. So I had the opportunity to do something I thought was artistically interesting. I had the opportunity to have a choice of any photographer that I wanted to work with to do any kind of pictures that I wanted to do. And so I looked at, I looked at it in that sense, that it was an opportunity to do something that I thought was artistically interesting. Um, Playboy, frankly, was the only uh, venue where I would have the opportunity to do that. You're doing something, and we should talk about this because it's upcoming. Um, 
and I called them family movies. Mm -hmm. Both would be would fit under oh, that category. Absolutely. Kind of a trend in Hollywood mm -hmm. where people are saying, they wait a second, they're successful. let's clean this up and let's appeal to a oh, wide variety don't, don't of people. Don't give it that high-minded. No, is it? Is it? That's it's not money. the reason. It's money. The only reason they're doing it. Basically, yeah. They, uh, those films are making money. Which ones are you coming up in? Um, the film I did this summer, which is going to be a new line release in, uh, at Easter, is called Monkey Business, mm -hmm. which is a kind of family comedy. With? With uh, Harvey Keitel and Thora Birch. I have to be honest, don't think of Harvey Keitel as the family movie think, type guy. I think but that's why he did it. He plays a mad gypsy and he's wonderful in it. All right. The other? And the other is what I'm working on uh, now. It's called The Yellow Dog, which is for Fox. And that's a family drama, family-oriented drama. And it's kind of touches of Old Yeller, touches of Incredible Journey, you know, um, adventure and lost children and dogs and finding them. And I actually took both of the projects because I happen to think that um, doing really intelligent family entertainment is a great idea. We should tell people that in addition to the movies we have talked about, you have an NBC project coming up called A Kiss to Die For mm -hmm. that will be out in December. Yes. Okay. Nice talking to you. Nice talking to you. I had a good time. Me too. Thank you, folks, for staying up later. I'm Matt Lauer. Bob will be back Monday night. Have a good weekend.